Let's talk about the isometric types. The topic is a very large topic. I mean, there are several things to talk about, but I'm just giving you the basic things that you might need to know. I'm introducing you to the seismic isolation. So if you want to go further, please uh, check some literature or maybe we can make another seminar on more details in seismic isolated building design. So what are the isolated types? There are two main isolated types that we that have been that are being used in the world. One of them is rubber bearings, the other one is friction, curved surface friction isolators. So, so let's talk about first rubber bearings. As it, the name goes, the, the main compound is the rubber. And rubber is extracted from the rubber trees uh, like this. And every day uh, they make a scratch on these trees and they collect the rubber compound. Then with the with applying some additional materials and with heat, they vulcanize this rubber and they create the rubber that we are using for seismic isolators and also for the other rubber compounds that you see in the daily life. For example, the tires of the cars or the soles of your shoe, all of them are composed from this uh, rubber material. And the top five rubber producing countries are given here. Maybe it's one of, it's one of your countries, Thailand, the main produ producer, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Vietnam. So uh, it depends on this, the product of these countries mostly. So if you want to produce your own rubber isolator, you have to import rubber compound in one of the countries that produce, that uh, has the rubber trees. What are the rubber bearing types? Actually, there are three rubber bearing types, low damping rubber bearings, high damping rubber bearings and lead rubber bearings. Low damping rubber bearings and high damping rubber bearings, when you make a section cut, they look like this. I mean, there are rubber layers and there are steel shims that make the vertical stiffness, that provides the vertical stiffness. In high damping rubbers, different than the low damping rubbers, there are some additional materials added to the rubber compound, which are called carbon black. And it gives, a, a, by, by adding this compound, uh, the damping capacity of the bearing increases. The low damping rubber bearings are not not mostly commonly that are not commonly used uh, alone. Uh, they are used with additional dampers mostly, because I said, if you remember that I said there are two effects of isolators. One is the primary effect was period elongation. Yes, you can achieve with low damping rubbers. The other one was additional damping, which you cannot achieve with low damping rubber. So you need high damping rubber bearings or you need additional dampers that are used with low damping rubber bearings together. Other than this, there are lead rubber bearings, as I said, that you make a hole inside the same low damping rubber bearing compound and you plug the uh, lead inside. So uh, the damping is uh, provided by the lead, lead inside. Uh, you might ask, okay, this isolator, this place is like maybe 50 centimeters uh, in 360 degrees in both directions. How it returns back? This is rubber. Rubber is elastic. When you pull the rubber, it displaces, it elongates. When you leave it, it comes back to the original position. So it's the same. Uh, when it displaces, the building displaces, then the rubber itself is uh, pulling back the building to the original position, recenters. Let's see a rubber bearing in action, a test, seismic isolated test. You see that? Rubber bearing displaces. This is a real uh, ground motion record applied to the isolator. But normally we do not do this in this in the test according to the course. We mostly apply the seismic action in single direction, unidirection, sometimes bidirectionally, but mostly unidirectionally. Let's see a test from the same testing facility, a shake table test. And you can see the rubber isolator here on the left with some cross linear bearings adopted. You see that the bearing, mo bearing moves, the, the building moves on the bearing, 
there is a lot of displacement. You can see that maybe 60 centimeters, 70 centimeters displacement. Only the furnitures with rollers or suspended things move in the building, but you do not experience any damage to the structural and non-structural components. If it was a conventional design building, you will see a lot of damage. How do we model rubber bearings? This is very simply uh, showing you an illustra illustration of uh, bilinear representation of rubber bearings, actually mostly lead rubber bearings. How do they behave? There is a first initial branch here, initial stiffness, elastic stiffness branch, which is which depends on actually, I mean, this, this initial branch you only see in the in the first loading phase. After that, the isolator moves in this in this curve, in the secondary, secondary slope, secondary stiffness branch. This is a force displacement representation. When we design the rubber bearings in our in the softwares that we use it can be any software we mostly use this bilinear representation with the initial stiffness then the secondary stiffness if we know all the components of this bilinear representation then we can model the lead rubber bearings easily the first initial branch is the k1 the initial stiffness which depends on the secondary stiffness actually and also the which depends on the lead plug uh, inside the the properties of lead plug inside the secondary stiffness depends on the rubber compound only i mean uh, if you change the size of your isolator or the shear modulus of the rubber compound then you can change the secondary stiffness you need i mean you can calculate the initial stiffness by multiplying actually approximately this can be 9 or 10 or maybe 11 maybe sometimes 8 but mostly 10 times the secondary stiffness, and you can model it like this. If you know the yield force and the yield displacement, then you can easily model this. Yield force, I mean, to calculate the yield force, you need the characteristic strength, which is the force that intersects the y-axis uh, here, this, this point. And it depends totally on the lead plug properties. You can, if you know the area of the lead plug, and if you multiply it with the, by the uh, shear strength of the lead plug, then you can calculate the characteristic strength. Then from the similarity equations, you can easily find the F by yield, yield force. And then uh, if you know the yield force and if you know the initial signals, you can calculate the yield displacement and you can have this bilinear representation. And if you adopt this in any software, you can do your analysis seismic isolators. Uh, when we design, we first do an equivalent linear analysis. And when we then, first we do equivalent linear analysis, then we do nonlinear time history analysis because the rubber behavior is uh, highly nonlinear. So we need nonlinear time history analysis. But every time, we compare the results of non-linear time analysis with equivalent linear analysis. And when you do equivalent linear analysis, you have to know how much damping is, how much equivalent damping is obtained by the rubber, the isolation system. So you need to calculate this. And the damping in this case is the energy, depending on the energy dissipated in a cycle. If you calculate the area of this cycle if you take it like a trapezoid and calculate the area inside which is wd here energy dissipated per cycle and if you use this formulation which comes from a sinusoidal waveform if you calculate this equation then you can calculate the equivalent damping to your structure so if it is 20 percent here is a table from american code asc if it is 20%, it says that you can reduce, reduce the 5% acceleration spectrum by 1.5. If it is, for example, let, let's check the 5%, what you use generally in your design, then the factor is 1. If it is 20%, 1.5. It, if it is more than 50%, then you can uh, reduce the 
aspiration spectrum by two, factor of two. The other type that we commonly use is the curved surface sliders. I prefer to say curved surface sliders because friction pendulum is a uh, product specific term. I mean, the, the first, I, I told you Victor Zayas, uh, he first called friction pendulum, so it's a product specific term. So in general terms, we can say curved surface sliders. How they behave is actually very simple. It's a pendulum motion. You have a curved surface, use like here. Now we will see the curved surface plate. On top, a slider, then a, an upper plate, and you construct your building on top of this. So the pendulum motion is independent of the building itself. No? If you know the length of your, the radius of the pendulum, uh, the radius radius of curvature of your isolator, then you can easily calculate the period of vibration of your structure. It is period equals to two pi root of uh, square root of the radius of curvature divided by the acceleration graph acceleration of gravity. You can take a rope with a mass down. You can make it vibrate. The vibration period will not change with the force acting on it. It will be always be the same. So this depends on this. It's very easy to calculate the equivalent linear properties of friction isolators. Then it depends on the pendulum motion. There are three types of pendulum isolators used, commonly used. The first invented one was single concave pendulum isolators, but this had some problems. The main problem is it depends on the friction. So when there is friction, there is heat. And when there is heat, the friction coefficient drops down. So uh, if it is a, a high seismic region uh, during a, an earthquake, this will move, the, the upper concave plate will move on the lower concave plate, upper plate will move on the lower concave plate, and there will be a lot uh, heat develops here. So there will be a reduction in the friction coefficient. And also the displacement capacity is limited. I mean. If you want to have a 50 centimeter displacement capacitor isolator, then at least this lower plate should have a diameter of one meter, you know? 50, meter, 50 centimeters here, 50 centimeters here. Then double concave pendulum isolators were invented this, by the same inventor, Victor Zayas, actually. How it works? Now you have a two, you have double concave plate. So the displacement is the size is actually half uh, the first motion let's say uh, starts in the lower part 25 centimeters then with the upper part 25 centimeters so uh, uh, when you have fifth, one meter diameter isolator here you can have 50 centimeter diameter isolator here plus plus uh, since there are two sliding surfaces also the heat effects are reduced heat effects are uh, halved as well so it's a, now mostly we use double concave pendulums in our design. Now there is the third invention by Victor Zayas. After the patent expires for the double concave and single pendulum, he invented triple friction pendulum isolators. Actually, this doesn't mean that there are uh, three different surfaces. Actually, there are four surfaces. You can see that there is an initial part here. Uh, there are two surfaces here and two surfaces here, but there are three friction. He can adopt three friction coefficients for three different uh, surfaces. One friction coefficient here, one friction coefficient here, and one friction coefficient in these parts. And uh, there is a lower friction in this in interior part, like let's say less than 1%. So during a small earthquake, even in, with a small earthquake, this isolator starts to move. In other type of isolators, let's say that the dynamic friction is 5%, unless the 5% of the seismic weight of the building act on the build, acts on, on the structure, it, they do not move. They act like conventional building. It means that after some level of uh, earthquake, they start to move. Before that, they move like a conventional building design. This 
has a great advantage on that. With a, even a small earthquake, they start to move. So it's Greece gives you comfort during an earthquake. I mean, with a four, four, four magnitude or five magnitude earthquake, you do not want to feel uh, the fear of earthquake like the other conventional building design. So this has a great advantage on that. Let's see the difference between triple pendulum bearing and a single pendulum bearing from this illustration. You see that a single pendulum bearing moves on a single surface, but a triple friction pendulum, first, the motion starts in the interior part with less friction. Let's see it again. With less friction, less than 1%, one, 1%, one let's say, then moves on the upper and lower place. The difference is this. Let's see a triple friction pendulum in action. Again, in the same laboratory, a shake table test. Again, a hospital. It is adopted as a hospital. You can see the displacement, maybe again 60, 70 centimeters, and uh, the building stands still. How do we model friction pendulum isolators? A binary design. Actually, it is easier than rubber bearings. Everything depends on the friction, actually, and the radius of curvature. Okay. So the initial stiffness is nearly infinite. It's very high. When it starts to move, I mean, you increase the force. Uh, let's say this is my mobile phone. Uh, I increase the force. It doesn't move. It's in this level. I increase the force more and more and more. And after a time, it starts to move. And it is this point. So it is the point that the friction uh, force is beaten. This is this point. You know the friction coefficient. And the friction depends on the axial load on it. If you know the axial load, you can calculate this, this point. Then the secondary stiffness is totally depending on the radius of curvature. Because when you push something, when you push uh, a structure, let's say, after it starts to move, after you beat, after you beat the friction, the, the friction I mean, the, the, the force stays constant. It doesn't change. Here, the only change in the force because of the secondary sickness is due to the, the curvature itself. I mean, the, the radius of curvature. So if you make a smaller radius of curvature, which makes a, a smaller sphere, a part of a smaller sphere, then this sickness is higher. If you make it more flat, if it is totally flat, this would be a Rectangle, I mean, it will be flat here also. But since it, it, there is a curvature, then it, it, it behaves like that. And the, the secondary stiffness is depending on the axial load on it and the radius of curvature. So if you want to calculate the maximum force, then you can, calc you can sum up the, the force here that first it starts to move and the force that you calculate by the secondary stiffness. If you calculate if you multiply it with the displacement, any displacement you want, then you can calculate it and you can calculate it easily. And if you want to know the effective stiffness, you can make the second stiffness to this level. So if you know the mass of your structure and if you know the effective stiffness, then you can calculate the effective period of your structure. And if you are doing an equivalent analysis, you will need the damping, equivalent damping. It's again the same. If you calculate the area inside and uh, put it into the formulation and you calculate the equivalent damping and again the same if you have 20 percent damping equivalent damping then you can reduce the acceleration response spectrum by 1.5